Let's just keep singing into the presence of the Lord. We love His presence. Holy Spirit, we just love Your presence. Just hover over this room this morning. Go forth and do what you what you're called to do, Holy Spirit. Oh, I love your presence. As we're singing right now. I love, I love. There's people in the atmosphere that's getting set free. People that's tuning in online that's going to be watching all over the world are being set free right now. It just keeps coming up in my spirit. Anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression. You're being broke free of depression right now in your life as we're speaking. And I just, I, I just put a command on that depression. It's got to bow its knee right now to the mighty name of Jesus. And I speak peace to the people that are dealing with anxiety. Just lift your hands to the mighty hand of God. Just worship Him and allow His peace and His comfort to come into your body right now. See, if we want something to change, we've got to invite a different, a different atmosphere into our life. And only how things is going to change in our lives is inviting the presence of God into our lives. You want to be free? He said when you know the truth and you honor the truth and you walk in the truth, He said because I am the truth, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. So if you want to know the truth, and the truth that truly sets you free, you just got to call out to the mighty name of Jesus. Because that name is above every other name. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And He said, I come to set the captives free. So anything that is captivating your life today, Jesus is wanting to set you free right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Just call out upon Him. We love You, Father. We praise You. We honor You. And we glorify Your mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, how's everybody doing this morning? Well, as we're getting ready to, uh, I'm going to take up the, the tithes and offerings real quick before we pray over the kids and, uh, and uh, before we get started this, this morning. And the Lord revealed in my spirit, and, he, and, he, and he, last night and this morning, He was really stirring up in my spirit about the, you know, the parable of the talents. Where one man got one talent, one man got two, three talents, one man got five talents. And, and the Lord was revealing some things to me about how people think He's a hard taskmaster. Master. See, when we start, as preachers start talking about giving a lot of times, you know, the first thing that comes comes the people's thoughts in the body of Christ. And I know some of you think about it sometimes too. It just, it just comes to your mind because the devil wants that to come up in your mind. Every time money is mentioned in the, in, in the church, you think, oh, that's all that preacher talks about. That's all that church needs is money. You know what I mean? Everybody has, has that thought. Well, see, when you think about that, you're 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 acting just like the servant with the one talent. Because he said, I thought you was a hard taskmaster.
Well, see, Jesus says we need to give out of the abundance of our heart. We need to we need to give with a cheerful, a cheerful heart. And if we're going to continue to to reap the blessings of God in our life, whatever whatever that is, because the Bible says you're going to reap what you sow. And so, if you're whatever you're sowing in your life is what's going to come back to your life. And so we need to be expecting a harvest of God's goodness in our life, a harvest of God's uh, uh, abundance in, in our life. That may be financially, it may be spiritually, maybe you may need a healing in your body. So what, what are you sowing into your body that's keeping you from receiving that healing? You see what I'm saying? Because a farmer, what happens if a farmer says, oh, it's dry this year, I'm not even going to waste time to even put any seeds in the ground because I'm I'm not gonna see that see that's foolish. Because a farm what does a farmer do? He 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 expects he expects a heart. It doesn't matter what the atmosphere is doing, what's going on in the earth, how dry it is, he, he he's gonna continue to sow and he's gonna continue to put them seeds in the ground because he's gonna expect a harvest in the fall. No matter what. Because he's gonna expect it to rain and it will rain one day. I don't know when it's going to rain, but it's going to rain one day. But we got to keep saying it don't matter if it's if it's dry, wet, or whatever. What what does the Bible call us to do? To keep stepping in faith, to keep sowing in faith, keep giving in faith. You might not have seen a harvest come, a breakthrough in your life yet, but what do you do? You keep sowing in faith, sowing the word, sowing the word in your spirit. Keep developing your spirit, man. Because we've all been been given a measure of faith. But it's what we do with what God gives us is, is, is what's going to develop in our life. You know, I'm talking about talking about a hard taskmaster. You know, a lot of people think with my daughters and stuff like that that a lot of times, and I've been told that, oh, you're a hard man. I just tell people, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit that's being produced in my children's life. So you need to ask yourself that. When you were given with the cheerful heart at one time in your life. And look what God, look at the goodness of God. He, 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 he brought you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Amen. Look at the fruit in your life. Look where you were in your past life to where you're at today. You're serving God. You're showing up to church. So just keep stepping. Keep stepping in faith. Keep becoming. Amen. So, uh, so if the devil's ever wanting to plan anything in your life to to get you to quit giving and to and, and and to uh, quit sowing them seeds, you know, seeds seeds come from in, in different forms, you know, just like a farmer sows some corn seeds, some cotton seed, some, you know, whatever seed it is, wheat seed or whatever it is. That's what he expects to reap or, you know, reap that harvest in. So just keep expecting God to bring a harvest in your life, but you got to keep sowing. Just because you didn't see a harvest last week or a month ago or two months ago. You just got to keep sowing. You got to keep giving. Whatever that is, keep telling people about Jesus. See, that's that's planting seeds. Don't ever quit. You may not be seeing a seeing a harvest. Or or, or the fruit of people that you've that you've sowed God's word into their life. You may not be seeing a harvest of that. And you may be uh growing weary like man god I'm, I'm working for you i'm doing all this, this this stuff and i'm doing what you're asking me to do and I'm, I, I'm i'm not seeing any results yet well keep giving keep sowing keep stepping in faith because that harvest will come to pass i promise you but see god the reason he give that one man just one talent and he didn't give them other talents like the rest of the the rest of the guys. 
because he knows the heart and it's the same way with your with your jobs and in different different uh areas that you serve in churches and stuff like that god knows your heart so if you want to reap abundant harvest what do you got to do you got to start giving an abundance of seed and it, you know dr barclay <clears throat> this we was in kentucky this last week and and uh at his minister's conference just for you know senior pastors and stuff and it's a small small group i don't know there's probably 30 pastors or something in that in that group that he invites to certain deals and and he was talking about that about his um, spiritual dad and pastor john osteen john told him you know because dr barclay said man we were we first started that church in Midland, Michigan. We were struggling financially. We didn't have nothing. He said we had a broke down smoking car with no air conditioner. Heater didn't hardly work. Rusted out floor and all, all that kind of stuff. And every time he would show up to go to go visit John there in Houston, he'd bring him a seed. But John Osteen told him, he said, Mark, he said, God's going to do some mighty things in your life. But he said, you've got, you've got to step out in faith. He said, you've been bringing me tens and fives and, you know, maybe $50 bills. He said, I, I received that. And he said, man, he, he said, I, I bless you for that. But he said, if you're going to continue to reap the abundant harvest that God wants in your life. He said, next time you show up, he said, I want a $100 bill from you. And and Dr. Barclay said, uh, man, that was a stretch for me and Vicky, a $100 bill, you know. I mean, that, that was a stretch because we was barely making ends meet. So he showed up, gave him a $100 bill, and he said, all right. He said, God's going to send you all over the world, Mark. He said, next time you show up, bring $1,000 to me. He's like, wow, I, don't, I mean, I can't even you know, do a hundred dollars. But next time he showed up, he he brought a thousand dollars. And then John stretched him to ten thousand dollars. And look where his ministry is today. He's a global minister all over all over the world, speaks into many ministers' lives, but that's where he was just being faithful to a spiritual dad and a spiritual dad was stretching him. He went back to visit John one other time. John never spent none of that money. He had all that that money thousands of dollars that dr barclay had had given to john john said looky here he said i ain't spent none of it. he said here go mark i want to give this back to you and dr barclay said no no sir he said uh i i, I wanted to bless you with the, and he said you know john osteen didn't need any money he when he died he was very very one of the wealthiest preachers that ever lived and he said, boy, John got all happy. And he's like, man, I've been wanting to buy this horse. He's like, I'm going to take this money and buy it. You know, but see, that's what just being faithful and keep stepping and keep honoring the Lord in, in, your, in your first fruits and your tithes and your offerings and, and everything and being a doer of what this word has to say. And you'll reap the blessings in your life, I promise you. Father, we just uh, pray over each and every individual here this morning as a soul, Father. And I just ask that there's a hundredfold return on their life, Father God, as they step in faith and so faithfully to your kingdom, Father. We thank you for this morning. We love you. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Everybody said? Well, this morning, we're going to do something a little special. At least I didn't even know it, but she's going to get the preacher on birthday sermon this morning. See what? <laughs> but no, uh, I want I wanted to honor my wife this this morning, and most most of you know, and and uh, what what a blessing it is to have spiritual parents in our lives, and and uh, and that speak into our lives, that pour into our lives, and and uh, so anyway. Uh, we have a special guest speaker this this morning, and and we wanted to honor Lisa with her birthday, and so. <laughs> so 
come up here, Lisa and Heather, and <clears throat> see. I didn't know if I was gonna get that get that pulled off or 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 not, but we. <laughs> So uh, anyway, if everybody extend their hand out and just sing, uh, Bridget, are you recording this? Sing happy happy birthday to Elisa. <laughs> birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Elisa. Happy birthday to you. Heather, do you want to pray over her now? Or? Oh, you want me to pray? All right. All right, Father, well, we just thank you for today. Father, I just thank you for the gift that Elisa is to us and to this body and to her family and to Nick. Father, and I just, I just bless her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet, Father, that she is just a light shining in darkness. When she walks, your light goes before her, and it just draws people unto, unto her so she can point them to you, Father, and that she is a warrior, and that the warrior on the inside of her, it does continue to arise and to grow. And as she walks into those hospital rooms, Father, her presence is your presence. She is a carrier of you, and when she walks into the room, those people just feel peace, and there is a light, and there is just an all-consuming just drawing to you, Father, and that if they don't know you, Father, I call them out of the kingdom of darkness because of the anointing on Elisa's life, because of the love that flows through her from you. Father, we just bless her, and I just thank you for the gift she is to me, to your body, and that she continues to walk with her head high, her shoulders back, knowing that she's carrying you and I call, <laughs> I just call her up. You continue to come up, you continue to grow, you continue to shine brighter and brighter. The path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter. Mm. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, I thank you. And I just call you faithful to watch over your word to perform it in her life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for all things done for us. And I pray that we'll all have a good day. And thank you for blessing us as we're here on this earth. And I pray that we'll, that we'll have greatest years in school and stuff in Jesus name amen the kids are released <laughs> well good be free I will be free well can you hear me no yes yes is this better up you want me to talk louder is this better Okay, perfect. He's turning me up back there. Well, my name's Heather Johnson. If I haven't got to meet some of you, some of you look new to me, but these are my kids on the back. My daughter, Chloe, and Laura, and Robert. I didn't bird these two. I just bird that one over there. <laughs> um, so, Nick, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to speak into y'all's life, and it's an honor. We've known each other almost the same amount of time I've been married to Trey. I think me, me and Trey will be married 10 years in... December. So, Lord help me. But I've known y'all. Y'all came into our life like right after that. So it's been nine years, I would say, eight and a half, nine years that I've known the two of you. And we've walked through a lot of stuff together, a lot of stuff. And I've seen you walk through a lot of stuff. And we've walked through a lot of stuff together. <laughs> and it's an honor to get to do life with you and just to see how the Lord is continuing to use you and that you never gave up because a lot of it was hard. A lot of the stuff that you walk through is hard, and it makes us question God sometimes. And if you've never questioned God before, um, stop lying. Yes, you have. <laughs> but you've walked through some really hard stuff that makes you question, like, okay. And I've watched you walk through it, not wanting to sometimes, 
but you got through it because you kept going. And that is, that's huge to keep going. And so I love you. And um, so I asked Nick if he had like a word for today. And of course, Proverbs 31 woman came up in his mind. And you are, you are all of that. And watching you walk through the whole trying to figure out what God, and knowing what God was doing. God, how are the resources going to come? And he was faithful every step of the way. It never looked like you thought it was going to look, but he showed up and here you are. And now you're getting to do what you know God placed in your heart all those years ago. And it hasn't been easy. And then you have is this little man right here. Oh, and then you have the new little man. Isn't that, I mean, like, all right, God, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But man, I mean, now you have your little man to carry on the name. Isn't that awesome? And he just keeps blessing us, yeah, and showing up and just, yeah, he's faithful. Um, so the word that I have today, um, I can't really, um, I'm going to put this right here. Yeah, <laughs> I come with a lot of notes sometimes, <laughs> so it's like I need a big platform. Um you are, you know, the, the embodiment of a Proverbs 31 woman, but I've, I've watched y'all train your kids. And that is so cool because, you know, I've, we train Chloe. Um, but Chloe comes from a broken, you know, because I didn't marry her dad. And then we are a blended family. And so they have other things trying to, you know, but thank the Lord she's with us 98% of the time. But I have seen the work in y'all's kids. And that is so cool. And the, the, absolutely, yeah. And just staying in the process, and then watching them, and then hearing the story, which what, Emery telling the doctor, no, it was Bridget telling the doctor about her blood. My, there's nothing wrong with my blood. Like in the name of Jesus, like she was speaking faith to the doctors, and I was like, yeah, like yeah, I rebuke you in Jesus. <laughs> but that is so awesome. And I remember when Chloe was little, we took her to. Um, this conference and I hear in the bathroom commanding the washcloth to like you stay still in Jesus name or whatever it was I don't but it's great to hear faith come out of our kids because how much better are they going to be than us they're learning it now instead of us learning it when we were in our 30s or however old y'all are I know that I'm older I, I started late in the game <laughs> um, but today is also what I what the Lord had put on my heart was teaching our kids and the body of Christ of how to fight not the body, not people, but how to fight spiritually. And man, and hear, I hear it come, well, Chloe says stuff all the time, and you're like, all right. You know, like when you're doing something wrong and then your kid calls you on it, if you say so, you'll have what you say. Do you really believe that? And you're like, oh, <laughs> dang it. Yeah. Um, but weapons of warfare, or weapons for warfare, where warfare, but us teaching our kids, and the body of Christ, because you're going to walk into those hospital rooms and just your smile, because you do carry the love. I mean, you are, I mean, is she not always smiling? Even when she wants to cry, she's always smiling. And I remember one time we were talking, and you did this, I thought everything was fine, and then you just started, you were still smiling, but you were just crying, and I was like, oh, wow, like, bless, you know, it, it was an ugly, pretty cry, because <laughs> she was still smiling, but she was just crying, and I was like, oh, but <laughs> but I'm just saying you always are smiling and you always are full of joy and you always are loving. And I know you have bad days. Don't get me wrong. I know we all have bad days. We're all human. But just the light that you do just shine and the love that you just exuberate onto people. Don't think that it goes unnoticed. I know some days they're just bad days. But you really, I love you and I'm thankful for you. And so what I, the message that I have... He is a very perfect husband, and he does nothing wrong. I know. Lord, help him. <laughs> That's why, yes, he, the anointing is stronger up here on the front row to break down lies. No, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hi, Tony. How are you? Hey, baby girl. How are you? I'm good. All right. So today we're going to talk about weapons of warfare, and I want to talk about, I have four points. But I want to talk about the first point being understanding who we are in Christ, our righteousness. And I know what y'all are taught here. And I know as a body, um, people think they understand what righteousness is. And some people probably, like you hear it, and but do you really understand what it means? 
Do we really understand who we are in Christ? Do you know what the word righteousness even means? Well, righteousness really just means right standing with God, right standing with God. But when we live the life that we normally, not normally, but we just being humans, you, let's start at the beginning. So what is righteousness? It means right standing with God. And it tells us in Romans 5, 17 through 21, it says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. So who is one man here? It's talking about Adam in the garden. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, say gift of righteousness, say time, gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came on all men. So that's talking about what Adam did in the garden. Judgment came on all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift, say free gift. The what? The what? came to all men, resulting in justification for life. So what Jesus did for us brought a free gift of what? Righteousness. So we were born sinners. Were, were we born sinners? Do you all realize that we were all born sinners? Like you're not just one day, oh, you become a sinner because you did something wrong. Like we were born with sin nature because of what Adam did in the garden, right? So there's nothing you can do to become a sinner. You just were born that way, right? Right. So, in order to be made righteous, we have to what? Absolutely, we have to be born again. We have to receive Christ. And righteousness is a free gift, so it's a gift. It's a gift, a free gift. What are you going to do with the gift? Do you know what the gift is? It's righteousness. Do you understand what righteousness means? Do you understand the benefits that righteousness has? Do you understand the gift. A lot of us, we, we don't understand the gift because I can see in the body, it's more like the body of crisis instead of the body of Christ. We're supposed to be walking in dominion and authority and power, and we don't sometimes. A lot of the times, it seems like this, the kingdom of darkness rules and reigns in this world instead of the kingdom of light, and it's because we as the body don't know who we are in Christ, and instead of standing up and fighting for what is ours and what God has given us, we take a seat and we let them rule and reign. And it's not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to know who we are in Christ. And so I'm here to remind you, because I know what Nick teaches, we sit, we have the same mantle covering, so to say, the same spiritual fathers that we sit under. So I know what he teaches y'all. So I know in here that you're taught that. So I'm not here to teach you something that you don't know. I'm just here to remind you of who you are in Christ and what the word says. So spiritual death reigned on all of us because of Adam. But Jesus came to give us life, and life, what, more abundantly? In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation in the Greek, it paints the picture of a new species, something that's never existed before. So the moment that you make Jesus the Lord of your life, your spirit man is born anew. I was um, mentoring a girl on the phone just two days ago, and she's not saved, and her husband's not saved. And, but she wants to, we all have a journey, and she keeps telling me, you know, I keep praying to God, and this is happening, and this is happening, and I'm like, it's time, like, you need to get saved. <laughs> well, I don't really know. Like, what do you, it's hard for me to wrap my head around, I guess, because, like, I've never questioned who God was. I've never questioned his faithfulness. Um, sometimes I do question him as far as, <laughs> You just like, how can you allow this to happen? But then you got to go back to, we live in a fallen world and trials and tribulations are going to come. And so I'm talking to her and I'm trying to minister to her and like, it's time to get saved. It's time for your husband to get saved and it's time. And then it puts you into the kingdom and then your spirit man is born anew. And then the things that I'm saying to you are going to mean something different. It's going, and it's sometimes you just hit your head and it's like, Lord, help me. And I, so I've been praying for her and y'all just, can agree with me that, man, they come out of the kingdom of darkness because they have three little kids. Yeah, and 
the three little kids need to walk in light too because, I mean, you know what the world is going to tell them, right? So any person in Christ, in the Greek, it means a new species. Say a new species. So it's brand new. And we have to what? We have to train it. Right? You have to tell your spirit man. Your spirit man knows, but you have to feed it the word of God. Because see, your, your heart is a what? It's a production center. And is all your heart knows how to do is produce what you put in it. So what are you putting in your heart? See, your eyes are gates and your ears are gates into your heart. So what you put in your eyes and what you put in your ears gets in your heart. And it produces whatever you put in it. When we drive down the road and I hit the little road movies, you know, like that. Trey comes up out of a sleep, and he'll be commanding angels and pleading the blood of Jesus. That's what comes out of Trey when pressure comes on. What comes out of you when pressure comes on? Bleep, 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 bleep. Right? I mean, I'm just, how, and so what you put in your heart is going to come out of your mouth, especially when pressure comes. You have a horse go down, you have a horse, or you have a horse trying to go down, and you start speaking word to that horse, and you start praying over that horse and commanding whatever it is. That only works if you have it in abundance in your heart. And it's not just a one time, oh, I'm going to speak to it today. No, you have to live a lifestyle of being separated from the world and continually renewing your mind to the word of God. Romans 12, 2 tells us not to be what? Conformed, but to be transformed. By the continual renewing of our mind. It's a daily process. And if you don't spend more time with God or any time with God, if you don't re renew your mind at all, if you just get saved, there's so much more to salvation than going to heaven. There's healing and prosperity and wisdom. There is so much more to salvation than just going to heaven. Do we know that as the body? Some people just get saved and they go right back. I mean, I'm a prime example. I got saved and went right back to living the life that I used to live. And it took years to get set free because nobody discipled me. Nobody told me, okay, you got to remove yourself from that. You've got to start thinking different, believing different. And the only way to think and believe different is what? Do something different and apply the word of God. So it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you will do in the future. You cannot undo the righteousness of God. That's who you are. Once you receive Jesus, you're made anew and you're made the righteousness. You are an, absolutely a new creation. You are made new. In 1 John 2, 1, it tells us, Little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. Amen. Sometimes our failures in life it can talk us out of our righteousness. We can start to see ourselves as the sin or the sinner. We are, okay, of course, they like to, uh, this is more of a religious thing. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Oh my gosh, stop saying that. Like, bless the Lord. You No, 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 either you're a saint or you're a sinner. They're two totally different natures. You can't be both. And if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, you're a saint. Now, you may sin, because you're human, but that doesn't make you a sinner. So you've got to identify, who, who am I? Am I a saint or am I a sinner? You may not act like a saint. You may not talk like a saint. But that's because you don't have a full understanding of your true righteousness and your identity. And we're human. And it is a daily process of renewing our mind and walking in the understanding of what that means. And having a hunger and a desire to grow and to become. So righteousness is who we are because of Jesus, nothing because of what we do. And there is nothing that we can do to undo his righteousness, right? But the devil's going to come and he's going to try to talk you out of who you are, right? And he's going to try to talk you out of God's goodness and God's faithfulness. Once we get a hold of our identity, once we get a hold of our righteousness, our identity will start to determine our behavior, because a lot of the times we let our behavior try to talk us into who we are. Like, because if you act like a jerk, then you think you're a jerk. Exactly. And I tell Chloe all the time, because, bless your heart, your time's coming. But I'm raising a 15-year-old girl, and so 
I'm raising a 15 year old girl. I'll just say it again. And that's lots of fun sometimes. And so I have to tell her, she's like, mom, stop talking about me. She's bending her head down. <laughs> I have to tell her, you're not acting like who you are. Like stop, you know, the, the whole sassy and the whole, you know, just being a girl a lot of the times. Right. But that's not who you are. You are kind and loving and respectful and honorable. And that's why it's very important as parents for us when we're correcting our children, not to call them brats or whatever the word you may use in that heated moment where you're mad. That's not who they are. They're not acting like who they are. Their behavior is not lining up with their true identity in Christ. And us as people, we need to learn that too, because sometimes we make stupid mistakes we fall into sin and we make dumb decision after dumb decision after dumb decision. And we think that we become the dumb decision. And that is such a lie of the enemy. But the more you understand your righteousness, the more you walk in the understanding that I have right standing with God is all I have to do is repent. Repentance is a gift and repentance is huge. And repentance, you can do it as many times in a day that you need to. And it puts you back in right standing and right position with the Father. So it's important for us to understand that we are the righteousness of God and there's nothing that we can do to change that. But we have to understand what actually, what does it all, because it is a multifaceted gift, just like salvation. There's more to salvation than just going to heaven. Well, there's more to righteousness than just right standing with God. Righteousness will make us a master over Satan. When we understand who we are in Christ and stop letting the devil talk us out of who we are, we become masters over Satan. And I don't like getting my backside handed to me. I don't know about y'all. But when we get into, I say spiritual warfare, I mean, just fights, period, just with people on the earth. It's not a person necessarily that you're dealing with. It's a spirit affecting that person. And I have to remind myself of that a lot here lately, we've been in this, it feels like a forever battle. <laughs> I mean, it's only been since October, so it's almost been a full year of walking through something that you would hope that you would, you probably wouldn't even wish it upon one of your worst enemies because of the pain that you know that it could cause. And so, and if you think that being in the ministry stops you from, <laughs> from having to deal with battles, you're wrong. Um, and so there's been a lot of questioning in my heart, like, okay, God, like, what is going on? But, you know, people have choices. And God gives us what? Free will. And we can either walk in alignment with the word and live a separated life. Or we can walk with the ways of the world and live in our flesh. But there are consequences to sin. There are always consequences to sin. God will forgive you the moment you repent, but there are consequences to sin. And then the devil's going to use that to try to talk you out of what? Who you are, to get you to walk in shame and condemnation. But my Bible tells me that there is no shame or condemnation in Christ Jesus. But you have to continually renew your mind, continually forgive yourself, continually let the Holy Spirit repaint that picture on the inside of who you truly are in Christ. Because if you're on social media all day long, is all you're seeing is fake, is all you're seeing is lie, or lies, is all you're seeing is people only showing you the good stuff or making up good stuff to make themselves look good. Those are lies. 90% of the time, it's just an embellishment. Nobody ever, my sister-in-law does a good job of posting real life stuff, and I'm like, gosh, I wish she'd quit airing out all the dirty laundry on Facebook. But on the other token of it, that's real life. People have bad days. People fail. We make mistakes. But if we never put the word before our eyes, if we never listen to it, then we don't really know. And we only listen to it on Sunday. Well, what happens when you drive out of here and somebody pulls in, out in front of you? Mm-hmm. Instead of the middle finger, uh, Riata, Pastor Darren and Lynette's daughter, um, she was like, Miss Heather, my new thing is phones down. I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I'm going to start doing the thumbs down. And sure enough, you leave the church. The moment you pull out on that street, you're going to have an opportunity to thumbs down somebody. But that's a lot better than something you have to repent for, right? And it'll make somebody think, like, thumbs down. Yeah, what you did was not cool. <laughs> so righteousness is a defensive and an offensive weapon. 
in the Bible, in Romans uh, or in Ephesians 6.14, it talks about having our breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness, what? It guards your heart. It protects your heart. The helmet of salvation, again, righteousness is multifaceted, right? We're fixing to learn this. Salvation is multifaceted. So you have your helmet of salvation to stop the fiery darts coming to your head and your breastplate to stop them from getting in your heart because what gets in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. And if you believe lies, you're going to talk lies and you're going to walk in lies and you're going to live defeated. And it's, um, Isaiah 59, 17, it says, put on righteousness as a breastplate. Put it on. You have to put it on. So if you have to put it on, you can take it off. You can forget to pick it up and put it on. You can forget who you are, right? Righteousness is also an offensive weapon. Righteousness in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, by the word of truth, by the power of God, and by the armor of righteousness. The armor of righteousness. And in Ephesians 6, 10 through, I guess it's through 21 or whatever it is there, that whole talking about the armor of God. When you study that out, the breastplate was like pieces of um, armor. And they were like, like, it looks like fish scales. And the more the Roman soldiers wore their breastplate and the metal rubbed up against itself, the more it became shinier and shinier and shinier. And when they were advancing on the battlefield in their breastplate that they wore every single day because they were a Roman soldier, they know who they were, and their breastplate is getting shinier and shinier. When that light hits their breastplate and it reflects the light, it blinds the enemy. So the more you understand who you are in Christ, the more you walk in your righteousness, in your dominion, in your authority, the brighter and brighter you get. And Elisa, I just keep seeing that in you. Every time you walk into these rooms, it's like a light, and it is like drawing people unto you. I mean, you are in such... I know ministry and the, the weight of it and the weight of being here and his wife, I get that. But what a blessing you have and an opportunity you have every time you walk into that room to be a light. And I just keep seeing that over and over. You walking in and then the, the, the light coming. And you getting to love on those people and not necessarily walking around with the Jesus. That's, and you know what I'm talking about. Just being like Christ. And... <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, yes, you are the aroma. So don't forget that. God's really, you are stepping into a new season. And you know, August 8 in the Bible represents new beginnings. And it talks about in Isaiah, oh, I have it written down somewhere. Um, he's making a new way, new beginnings, making a desert or a river in the desert. As you walk into those rooms, you're bringing change, you're bringing hope, you're bringing peace, you're bringing love, and you're bringing hope, absolutely. And your words are going to be anointed to touch those people and to bring change and to see the ones you need to minister to. And your hands are anointed, and when you touch them, and you know what it's like to have an anointed hand touch you and you just feel the power and the hot and the heat and the, whoo, thank you, Jesus. Yes, you are a vessel. Remember that. Righteousness is also a covering. Isaiah speaks of being covered in righteousness. In Isaiah 61, 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and he has covered me with a robe of righteousness. A robe of righteousness. I used to wear them all the time in the beginning days of my preaching. I always had, remember the robe things I would always wear? <laughs> robe of righteousness. Because the devil was always trying to talk me out of who I was. Getting of all the bad thoughts. And this is who you are. This is not who No, 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 no. Though This is who I am. <laughs> and I would wear that robe of righteousness as a reminder that God chose me because I chose him. Yeah. And I chose to believe him because you may hear the word, but you know you have to make a choice to believe it and you have to make a choice to apply it. Because we can sit in church all day long and hear the word, but what are you doing with the word when you leave here? Are you implanting it into your heart? Are you believing it? Are you letting it grow? Are you walking in the true understanding of it? 
because if you don't believe something, you won't apply it. The robe covers us from head to toe. From head to toe, we are covered in righteousness. In Ephesians 6.11, we see the whole armor of God. It says that we're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil wants to assault us. The devil wants to talk us out of who we are. He wants to tell us that we're not righteous, that we're not worthy, that we're not loved, that we have no value, that we're never going to amount to nothing, that we're going to die just like Aunt Boo Boo died of cancer, or you're going to go under, you're never going to have enough money. You don't have enough money to do with that dream that God, to carry out the dream that God put in your heart. There's never going to be enough money. Those are all lies to try to keep you bound and keep you held down. And the devil, the word devil is taking diablos in the Greek, diablos, devil. And it paints the picture of one who takes a rock and strikes your head over and over and over. And that's what the devil does. He plays mind games with you. He takes the thought that you're going to die of cancer just like everybody else in your family died of cancer. You're never going to have enough money just like nobody in your family's ever had enough money. You're never going to amount to anything. You're always going to be damaged, goes unloved, unworthy. All of the things the devil tries to talk about, talk us out of who we are. But you have to know, Brother Hagen says it best, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. What that means is you can't stop the thoughts from coming, but you can pull them down. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it talks about, it paints the picture, it talks about uh, pulling down strongholds. And it paints the picture of a Roman soldier, you know with this little spear thing, this little knife thing? It, it paints the picture of him taking that thought and pulling it down. But once you take the thought and you pull it down, meaning you have to identify the thought. You have to know that if your thoughts aren't lining up with the word of God, you need to know what the word says about you. Take the thought and pull it down, but then you have a hole. What are you going to put back in the hole? You have to. So he tells you that you're ugly and you're no good and you're never going to amount to nothing. No, this is what I identify, that those are thoughts. Those are lies of the enemy. So I take them and I pull them down and I put back up that I'm loved, I'm chosen, I'm blessed, I'm redeemed. I'm set apart for his calling. You have to talk to yourself. You can't do mental gymnastics in your head when the devil comes and starts playing mind games with you. And you have to identify that those are mind games. And you have to be mindful of your thought life. Are we mindful of our thought life? <laughs> I'm glad that you are because I can sometimes, I can tell by my attitude that I have not been thinking on the right things. Yes. Second point of my message. So we're shifting gears. So we're talking about weapons of warfare, how to fight the devil, how to walk in victory, how to walk in dominion and authority. The first one is understanding your righteousness. And it is, man, we could preach on righteousness for weeks, but I'm just giving you some little snippets here so we can take it and walk out of here with a plan to become better tomorrow and then the next day. And if we'll apply these, I mean, these are just foundation, but they're all faith. My second one is walking in love. What? Like, yeah, we all got that. We're Christians, right? We love everybody. <laughs> Liars. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, we're not doing so hot on that. And I'm talking to myself sometimes, too, because I, we live in this world, and it's like people don't know what bathroom to use. They don't know who they are. It's like, check your plumbing. It's not that hard. The author of confusion is who? Satan. And people are just confused about everything. We don't know. They don't know where they're going, what up, down, around. Who, who am I? I don't know who I am. We were talking the other night, and they were talking about, <laughs> what was it? It was, they, she doesn't identify as, I don't know, they're talking about barrel racing or something. And I was like, oh, bless the Lord, that's going to preach one day. Because, like, barrel racers, what was it? It doesn't matter. The point is, who do you identify as? Do you know who you are? Do we? Do we really know who we are? Do you know? Absolutely. Um, we say that, <laughs> but then you, absolutely. Us in this room know, but are we walking in love out there with people? And so what does love mean? Love is just an intense emotion. It's a deep affection or feeling towards another. And people these days, they love everything from pizza to their dog to their horses to their new shoes. We love, we love everything. No, 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 no. Love God love people. We like things, 
And so it devalues the word love because we use it so much to, to things that you can't love pizza. You can't love your, I mean, me and Trey will go to toe on this because I'm like, Joy, my, I have a little white fluffy dog and she's so cute. And I just think that I love her because she's very sweet. <laughs> she doesn't talk back and she's always happy to see me. Um, but she doesn't have a spirit. She has a soul, but she doesn't have a spirit. So we love people and we love God. In the Bible, there are four different types of love. There's eros, which is a romantic love. There's phileo, which is friendship kind of love. There's storge, which is the family kind of love. And then there's agape, the unconditional love of God. Again, agape love is the God kind of love. It's unconcerned with self. It's concerned with the greatest good of another. It's a choice to put others above yourself. It's a choice to put others above yourself. It is. So this is what the Bible tells us that love is. Just in case anybody's confused, I'm just going to help us out here. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, or 4 through 8, it says, Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It does not seek his own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Okay, here's a good one, <laughs> because this is so twisted in the body of Christ. Did Jesus preach love and acceptance? You are the first body that has ever told me that. Good job, Nick. <laughs> you know, I have preached this, not this necessarily this message, but I've preached in all kinds of denominations across the board. And when I say that, they're like, yes, amen. Jesus preached love and acceptance of where's the scripture? <laughs> there's no scripture. You mean there's no scripture? What did, what did Jesus preach? He preached kingdom and he preached repentance. Where's the scripture? That's what you need to ask. If, some, if somebody says something to you and you're like, exactly, Matthew 4, 17, Matthew 4, 23. So that's Matthew 4, 17, Matthew 4, 23, Matthew 9, 35. Jesus preached kingdom and repentance. He did not preach love and acceptance. Now, Jesus is love. And Jesus, he didn't really accept people he didn't accept sin. But Jesus was loving. Jesus was kind. But Jesus, when he sat with sinners, he changed them. He didn't allow them to change him. And how many times do we sit with sinners and we choose the wrong friends and we sit in the wrong atmosphere and we sit in the wrong group of friends for so long and next thing you know, instead of you changing them, they've changed you. It is so important, and I tell my daughter this all the time, and for the younger people, it's important who you hang out with. It is important who you hang out with, and the conversation is different when you're sitting with people of faith and people that are going after God than people that are, oh, what'd you do at the bar last night? Really? Like, it may be fun at the moment, but it's just bondage, and it leads to nowhere good. But it's an optical illusion, especially to the younger generation and even to older people, too that have never got out of that lifestyle and never walked in freedom. They don't know anything different. And we cannot be just like the world and change the world. And it is okay to be different. And if you're not being different, then I'm going to challenge you to start being different. When you walk into a room, the atmosphere should change because of who you're carrying on the inside of you and your understanding of what you have on the inside of you. We do not compromise our beliefs. And Satan is trying to get us to compromise our, our beliefs by camouflaging it as compassion. Oh, you just got to love everybody just the way they are. Absolutely not. God loves people, but he hates sin. And we can love people and hate sin. There was a moment in time, a season not too long ago, where I couldn't even walk into Ulta or that Sephora. What are you doing with all that makeup on your face? And you're a boy. Like, I just want to, like, Wipe it off. And I went into Sephora the other day, the other day to get something for Chloe, and I hadn't been in that Sephora, and I was like, "Oh, bless the Lord." Okay, I was like, "Really, Lord?" And I, I mean, I'm talking to myself out loud because I walk in, there's like three guys, and they they're guys, 
and they aren't trying to be girls. They just have on makeup. I mean, they're trying to be girls, but like they're not the right, uh, the whatever. Right. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I am going to practice what I preach. So I walked up to one of them and I was just loving and kind as I could be, because you know what? It's the love of God that's going to change people. It's not us being mean and hateful and calling them out and laughing at them. And then we pray for them. And so I prayed for the scales to come off of his eyes, for God just in labors into his path to share goodness and truth with. And that's what we need to do. When we encounter people that we want to make fun of, when we walk away from them, we need to be praying for them, praying for deception to come down, praying for labors to be sent into their path. And I do this to my kids all the time when we're traveling and Robert actually called me out yesterday. We were over in Dallas. I was like, oh, this guy's drinking at 10 o'clock. We, we went to Dallas for a barrel race. And we're leaving. Oh, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> and we're leaving. And, you know, it's over at the state fair or whatever. And that's not a, necessarily a good part of town. And there's this, this guy walking. And he's, it's 1030 in the morning. He's got this big old 40. And I was like, bless the Lord. I'm like, he's drinking. Robert's like, why don't you pray for him? I said, okay, I will. And so, <laughs> but I do that to my kids all the time when we're traveling. Because we get to see all kinds of different stuff, and you're like, and sometimes I find myself, and I'm like, whoa, okay, let's pray for them. <laughs> because it's like, sometimes you see it, and you're just like, are my eyes deceiving me? Like, we are definitely living in the days of Noah. Like, seriously. The twistedness of perverted, and it's just like, Lord, help us. But he's commissioned us to help his people. The ones that are lost, the ones that are twisted, the ones that don't know what bathroom to use, we need to start praying for them instead of making them feel, because they know they're wrong. They absolutely know they are wrong. But they're trying, like those whole pride rallies they have, and they're just out, like, really? You're just trying to make me be okay with? I will not be okay with sin. And I don't have to accept sin, and I don't have to accept you trying to shove it down my throat. But I do have to love you, because that's the only thing that's going to lead people back. And it's the goodness of God that leads people to what? Repentance. We have to be loving. We have to show the love of God. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Are we loving other people the way God has loved us? Do we love ourselves the way God loves us? Absolutely. And to the degree that we love ourselves is only the degree that we can love somebody else. So how are you getting right with yourself? You've got to love yourself. And you have to understand no matter what you've done wrong or how all your shortcomings that you think you have, if you're a born-again child of God, you know how God sees you? He sees you just like Jesus. He sees you through the blood. And you are a representation of Jesus upon the earth. And God, you've got to get an understanding of that. If we would set down our sin consciousness and pick up righteousness consciousness, the world would be a completely different place. John 15, 12 says, This commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. 1 John 4, 21 says, This commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother. This is agape love, the unconditional kind, the unconditional love of God. He's not telling you you have to like them. You don't have to like people. There's a lot of people I don't like, but I can agape love them. You have to love them. You have to be kind. We have to be nice. And I'm not saying, again, do not accept sin. That's not what I'm saying. Love people, hate sin. God loves people, but he hates sin. Here's another one. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, you can only love your neighbor as you love yourself. How are you doing with loving yourself? It's a, sometimes it's a daily thing, and that's fine, as long as we're honest and we know. But walking in it, not sitting in it, walking it out. Desiring and purposeful mindset to grow, to change, to come up, to become better. Because God is an ever-changing God. We should be ever-changing, and we don't. We get stuck. We get potted. You can't grow in a pot. You can only grow so high and so tall. It's why you have to smash the pot, stop smoking the pot, get out of the pot, right? <laughs> Absolutely, get out of it. So to love is a command. 
It is not a suggestion and it's not a choice. It's a command. And you have to choose to love. So we love people and we hate sin. Say love people, hate sin. This is a good one. Walking in love is the highest form of spiritual warfare there is. The devil cannot overcome love. The devil cannot overcome love. When you're walking in love with the people, you'd rather just punch them in their face than to be nice to them. But instead of doing that, you crucify your flesh and you walk in love. You be the example. You be the bigger person because you have what? The love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Yes, absolutely. Do not love sin and don't agree with sin. And it's okay to call sin out, but we have to do it with our words wrapped in love. Because sometimes <laughs> I can get a little on the muscle. I don't know if y'all are horse people. I know y'all are horse people, but being on the muscle, uh, hey! like, okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey! you can just be like this, like, oh, you just want to like tell them about themselves. But if your words aren't wrapped with love and grace and sometimes telling them, that's not what you're called to do. You're called just to love them and show them and lead by example. Lead by example. What is your example? Jesus is our example, but sometimes my example isn't that. And then I have Mr. Perfect, my husband. <laughs> my husband really is pretty close to being perfect. He's not perfect, but he is so loving, and he is so kind, and he is so patient, and he is so forgiving. And I'm like, third time? You're fired. I'm off with your head. I don't want, you know what I'm saying? Like, th these are my mentality. This is what I'm, this is what I have to overcome. These are just the way, you know, I have a business mentality and God has put me in the ministry world. And it's like, Troy's like, Heather, that don't work. <laughs> and we're going to keep forgiving. And we're, and I'm like, I'm done. Like, I'm done. Like, how many times? And Trey's like, Heather, what's the scripture say? And I'm like, oh, bless the Lord. Have a bad day already, okay? <laughs> and I really don't mean for him to have a bad day, but he's one of those that very rarely has a bad day. And even if he does have a bad day, he's still super loving and kind. And sometimes it's just like, it can be annoying. I mean, I'm just being honest. Like, someday it's like, can you just come down here and join me? And like, you know how misery loves company. But thank the Lord that he isn't moved by me. And he doesn't listen to my nonsense. And he pulls me up. And so, ladies, it's always good to have that, that covering. Because your husband should be your covering. Your man should be your covering. And your man should be going after God and pointing you to God. And man, you should be that. Make sure that that's how you're leading your wife, that you are being the example, the covering, and you're pointing her to the Father, and you're speaking life to her. And then women, we got to make sure that we're respectful and honorable with our tone and our voices, right? I'm talking to myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm a work in progress. Yeah, I know, right? Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for helping us. So walking in love, or walking in forgiveness is my third point. Walking in forgiveness. This one is super hard to do. Especially when people come after you, not after you, like running after you, but they like throw accusations at you. They try to destroy your character. They say they're going to always be there to help you and serve you. And then a day later, you're like, well, where'd you go? <laughs> Especially in ministry, right? Oh, I'm here to help and I'm here to serve. And then it's like, oh, because you didn't get it your way. You and it's like, uh, <laughs> I'm not here to serve you. You're here to serve. And it's not necessarily you, but it's the Lord, and you're Lord, the Lord's representative, and people, people are people, and we got to remember that. None of us are perfect, and we all miss it, but people get hurt in church, and they leave, and they never go back, and they want to blame God, and it's like, no, no, God didn't do that. You got to remember that you're dealing with people, all kinds of different personalities. People are not perfect. God's perfect, but we have to walk in forgiveness. Matthew 5, 43 and 44 says, you've been told to love your neighbors and hate your enemies. We get to hate our enemies. Isn't that cool? You have to finish reading the scripture. Yeah, you can do a mic drop. Yeah. You've been told to love your neighbors and to hate your enemies. But this is Jesus talking. And he says, but I say to you to love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those that hate you and pray for those that spitefully use you and persecute you. How are you doing with praying for the ones that have come against you? Yeah, we do. And I can tell you, I mean, this thing that we've been going through since October, it's hard. 
mean, because there's so many different people attached and there's so many different lies and there's so many different accusations and there's so many, and it's like, and it's in the sphere that we're called to, which is the rodeo world. And it's like, but I see what's going on. I see the devil's tactic. And so you have to see from an internal standpoint and you have to see beyond right in front of your face and you have to see what's, what the enemy is trying to do. But then you have to also realize that I'm not dealing with a person, I'm dealing with a spirit, especially when it's trying to destroy. Anything that comes to steal, kill, and destroy is what? The enemy. God does not employ the devil to get your attention. And I know that y'all know that, but I'm just confirming just in case you forgot or you think that God needs, you know, to put you in a car wreck to teach you something. That's stupid. Please don't say that. And I don't mean, I do. I mean, that's stupid. That's not God. (laughs) Stupid might not be a nice word, but thank you. Thank you for your agreement. God doesn't use that. That's why we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us and we have to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We have to be in tune to the Holy Spirit because he will give you a check in your spirit. And sometimes we listen and sometimes we don't. But walking in forgiveness, Romans 12, 14 tells us to bless those who persecute us who are cruel in their attitude towards you. It is hard to forgive somebody who is cruel to you and that talks about you constantly and it's like I didn't know I was so important that's so great (laughs) and like I'm glad that you're like keeping me on the headlines there but I mean come on absolute absolutely but are we forgiving remember forgiveness is about our our heart it's not about what the person has done to us and you know I do a lot of women's conferences and a lot of the time I deal with a lot of molestation rape abortion miscarriages that try to bring shame onto women and they don't want to forgive whomever or whatever had happened. Do you know what some benefits of unforgiveness are? Oh, yeah, definitely all kinds of stuff in your body. So benefits of unforgiveness. It hinders our prayer life. It hinders the love that we have on the inside of us to flow through us to others. Faith will not work in an unforgiving heart. Faith will not work in an unforgiving heart. Unforgiveness causes bitterness, which bitterness is like a cancer of the soul. I I, I love like older people. I've always had a heart for older people, but some of them suck the air out of the room when they walk in, you know, and you're like, okay, crotchety granny, seriously, like be nice. But you know what the meanness is about? Unforgiveness and bitterness. And they've carried it and carried it and carried it. Absolutely. Not forgiving is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You drink the poison, but you're expecting them to die because you don't want to forgive. You want to hold on to it. That's that's a benefit of unforgiveness. The last one is we open a door for Satan to bring trouble into our life. Say, what? We open a door for Satan to bring trouble into our life. Where's the scripture? Where's the scripture for that? Because that's a pretty, like, you're telling me I'm opening a door to Satan by not forgiving? I am. Your scripture is 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. And Paul's talking there about when we don't forgive, we open the door. So when you're walking in unforgiveness, you're walking in sin, and you're opening the door for Satan to come into your life and wreak havoc. And the Lord showed me a picture of my my uh, shield of faith, and it had all these holes in it, because I was, we were, anyways, and I'm like, okay, Lord, what is going, what are, what are these holes, and he was showing me, it was like battery acid just eating through my shield, and he showed me that it was unforgiveness in my heart, which was allowing the fiery darts to get in, and is all we have to do is repent for unforgiveness, forgive the person, and forgiving the person means you pray for them, You release them, you bless them, you let it go, and every time it comes up in your mind and the devil tries to remind you, no, 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 I've already bless them, I release them, I forgive them, I let it go. I'm not saying what they did was right, but it's not our job to, vengeance is the Lord's, it's not ours, and we have to leave that up to the Lord and trust that he's going to make it right, because if I trust the word and I trust God, at some point, somehow, some way, he's going to work it out. And when we pray for the people that come against us, I'm not praying for you, or not you personally, but like I'm not praying for them to get a new job or a new car. 
No, I'm asking the Lord to bless them with a revelation of how they're acting, a revelation of what's going on in their heart that's making them want to do the things that are causing hurt towards somebody else. Because remember, hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. So if somebody's acting a way that's not any kind of characteristics of God, you got to know that they're hurting and what's going on with them. Lord, show them about their heart. So walking in forgiveness. The fourth one is understanding the power of our words. Do we understand the power of our words? We say that we do. But then we talk about our feet killing us, our back killing us. Oh, this headache's killing me. I love you to death. I just love you to death. Please don't love me to death. I'm trying to live. (laughs) But we say dumb things, right? Because Granny, Aunt Boo Boo, Uncle Ding Dong, everybody has said dumb things my whole life. And I hear all these dumb things, and I think it's so cute to say I love you to death. And sometimes I say dumb stuff, and Chloe's like, if you say so, is that really what you want? And I'm like, bless the Lord. And in our house, like, we're, I say we're not allowed, but so we live a very separated life, and we live a very separated life for a purpose, A, because we are called to this platform, but B, because that's what God told us to do. Not everybody has to live as separated as we live, but when you call me to pray for you, and you want God to show up in your body, you need to know that my prayer is going to work, and how is my prayer going to work? It's going to work to the degree that it works. It works Trey can pray over dead steers and they come back to life. Now, we've had it work when we pray and we've had it not work. I don't want you to misconstrue that I'm saying every time we pray, it goes exactly the way we pray. That's, that's just, it's, that's unreal. But when we pray and it works, which is nine times, eight times out of ten, It's because we understand the power of our words. We live a separated life. We don't watch whatever. I don't let my kid watch whatever. I don't listen. let her listen to whatever. And some people think we're very strict as well. I've been told that we're very strict and you can't have any fun. And No, no, no. God wants us to have fun, but in the confines of how he interprets fun. And getting people healed and saved and delivered and set free, that's fun. Not smoking, drinking, fornicating, running around, living, having, you know, going to the bar. Because again, optical illusion. It appears fun, but it's bondage. It's bondage. <laughs> there you go. They absolutely, absolutely. It's very true. It's very true. There's a whole, that's a whole, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole sermon. <laughs> yes. Yes, so words are the most powerful things in the universe. God created the world with his what? With his what? And then Jesus gave us dominion and authority to do greater works than he did with our what? With our words. Jesus spoke to storms and fig trees and and fevers and demons. He spoke to them. There's a time to speak and there's a time to pray. But if you talk diarrhea mouth 85, 90% of the day, and then you want to speak faith for 5%, it's not going to work the way that it's created to work because the angels are like, well, you're just talking diarrhea mouth over here, but now you want to speak faith. And I'm like, oh, so I go to do faith. Oh, wait, you're talking diarrhea mouth again. Okay, I can't. So your angels are kind of like, because you know that you have angels assigned to you, and they're, they're going to hearken unto your words when you speak faith. Do you send your angels on assignment? Do you use your words properly? Do you? Know, I mean, I know you have angels because I know who your pastor is, but are you using them to the degree that they're created for you? They're created to serve you. We don't serve angels. They're below us. And they hearken unto our words when our words are in alignment with the word of God. How are you speaking? Chloe did a science project when she was in sixth grade, and they wanted you to do a Bible verse. We did Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We had two plants. One plant was life. One plant was death. We spoke life over it. The dead plant or the death plant, Trey made us take it outside and speak over it because we're not allowed to talk like that in the house. And I actually, we didn't say a whole lot. I had my mom was going through a divorce at a time at the time. And so I called her and let her yell at the plant. (laughs) Yeah, because it does. It feels bad to say you're ugly, no good, you know, trying to, you know, speak the death words. And so I was like, 
got a revelation, call your mom, let her get it out. <laughs> so we'd take it outside, set it on the table, and I gave them the same amount of water. They had the same amount of light within three days. The life plant that was the more smaller plant, it started blooming and growing and getting bigger. And the death plant, which started out as the more lively or bigger, thicker plant, the leaves started wilting and turning brown. By the end of the thing, the death plant was almost completely dead and the life plant was life. And then we started speaking life to the death plant and it started coming back. And then I killed them both by not watering them. However, <laughs> I'm definitely not a plant person. But you know that that spoke to my daughter. And, you, and I tell that message a lot in certain, Well, when the Lord shows me to, uh, to make you understand the power of your words. Your words really do carry power. And you will have what you say is in the power of the tongue. Absolutely. And in James 3, there's a whole chapter related to the power of the tongue. It talks about horses and bits mouths and the little rudder on the ship and how that little rudder steers that whole big ship. The words that you say over your life and over your kids and over your finances and over the ministry and over the church, they carry power. God gave us the power of our words to create what are you creating? What are you speaking? What are you believing? If we want to walk in dominion and we want to walk in authority and we want to have what the Bible promises, we have to get our line, our words in alignment with the word of God. Yes? So, we are called and created to walk in dominion, to walk in authority, to walk in love, to walk in forgiveness. How are we doing? You are created in the image and likeness of God. You are a vessel on this earth. How are you doing? <laughs> well, God wants you to know. And it's time to grow, and it's time to change, and it's time to come up. Because we are in the last days, and it is our job to be lights shining in darkness. And so it is time for us to get our heads out of wherever we've got them at, and we have got to get our words right, our believing right, and our acting right. So, Father God, I just thank you for the word today. I just sow it into their hearts, and I thank you that they came with soft hearts, and they're leaving with soft hearts with the word of God sowed into their heart, and I put a demand on your word to work, to produce, to grow, that they desire to grow, they desire to change, they desire to come up. I want us to say this as a church body. I want you to think of what it, whom and whatever it is that you need to forgive and in your mind, you know whom it is you need to forgive, that you've not forgiven. God wants you to begin today to release that person and to forgive them and to let them go. So together as a church family, I want us to say, Father God, I admit that I'm hurt, that I'm offended, and that I'm angry. In obedience to your word, I choose to forgive. I choose to release, and I choose to let go. Holy Spirit, help me to be willing to continue to walk out forgiving, even when I don't feel like it. Father, I ask you to bless whomever. Well, right there in that whomever part, you need to say whomever that is to you. You don't have to say that out loud, but just to yourself, Father, I ask you to bless. And I ask you to speak health and healing over their life, over their hearts, and over their minds. And I release them. I let it go. Holy Spirit, help me to continue to walk it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we need a, um, we're going to pray one more time, Nick.
so I want us to say a prayer together collectively as a family to help us walk in love. Because we think we have an understanding of it, but I, I, I tell you, we don't have a true, deep enough understanding of how to walk in the agape kind of love. So together as a church family, let's say, Father God, I thank you for your love, for your mercy in my life. Holy Spirit, I ask that you help me to love God, to love people the way I was created to love. The word says that I have the love of God shed abroad in my heart by you, Holy Spirit. So I'm asking that you help me tap into the love, to walk in that love, to walk in revelation of it, so all that I come in contact with, they feel your love. And they know that they've encountered Jesus through me. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for their willingness. I thank you, Father, just for our obedience to your word. Father, and as we go out of here today, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you recall this word to us. And that we walk in dominion. We walk in authority. And I just speak to our immune systems and I command them to be strong and to war and to fight. Our red and white blood cells, you war, you do your job. And anything that's in our body that is out of alignment, I command it to come back into alignment in the name of Jesus. And I call in resources from the north, south, east, and west. Father, and I put a demand on your word that says you supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus and that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. So angels, you go. You march and increase into our life, into this ministry, into this church house. Angels, you go and cause it to come. And we call forth rain in the name of Jesus. Rain, you come. Winds blow in the rain. High, low pressures, you get in right alignment and rain comes to us. Rain comes to our country land. In the name of Jesus, Father, help us to be lights shining in darkness. Help us to point people to you by the love that comes out of our heart. Father, we love you, and we call you faithful, Father, faithful to watch over your word to perform it. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you get something out of the word today?